In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. <clears throat> Every Sunday in Lent, brothers and sisters, is dedicated to either a different theme or to a specific person. For example, last week we celebrated the Sunday of Orthodoxy, where we remembered the restoration of the holy icons. This Sunday, we remember St. Gregory Palamas. Next Sunday, we have the midway mark of Lent, and we celebrate the cross. The Sunday after that is dedicated to an ascetic called St. John of the Ladder, Climacos. And then on the fifth and final Sunday of Lent, we dedicate it to a holy woman, an ascetic, whose name was Mary, and we know her as Saint Mary of Egypt. And so as I mentioned, this Sunday, which is the second Sunday of Holy and Great Lent, we dedicate it to this great father of our church. And his name was Gregory, who was also the Archbishop of Thessaloniki. He was born in the 12th century in Constantinople. And today, he's regarded as one of the greatest saints in our Orthodox Church. Such a great saint that the whole city of Thessaloniki has him, after Saint Dimitrios, as the protector of the city. And I know that many of you, or many, are descendants from that city, from Thessaloniki. But other than that, he's renowned in the entire Orthodox world, the Orthodox Church. He was known for his strong defence of the faith, of the truth. And so that's why a lot of the fathers say that today is like another second Sunday of Orthodoxy, a continuation from last week where we celebrated the triumph of truth, of Orthodoxy. His parents were very devout people. But apart from being very devout, they were, they were very wealthy. And they left from Constantinople because they were exiled from there because of the Turkish invasions at the time. His father was a master of prayer. And we could say he's the one that taught Gregory his first steps towards prayer, asceticism, and eventually sanctification. We're going to come back to this word asceticism a little while later. But just so you can get a little bit of a background of who this person Gregory was. His parents, they had seven children and they were wealthy. And today, both of them, along with Gregory and most of his siblings, they are canonised as saints. We recognise them as saints. His father was in the Senate, in the, in the Emperor's Senate. And so he was there at the meetings, at the governments there, and he was asked to speak. But not only that, he was the right-hand man of the emperor. Imagine that. Such a holy man, such a man of prayer, who was also the right-hand man of our emperor, of the emperor at the time. This is how pious not only the people were, but those in authority. And it's very, very scary looking at the difference of those who are in authority at the time and those who govern our countries and our governments today. When you see the people who, who were governing then and governing now, it's a very disturbing thing. It is said that Gregory's father was such a practice, such a lover of prayer, that even during the Senate, next to the Emperor, he would become deep in prayer, he would fall deep into prayer. And so when he was spoken to, he didn't even notice. And when he was even addressed by the emperor. So when those who were around him said to the emperor, should we nudge him a bit so he can snap out of it, so we can 
came, come out of his deep prayer? The emperor said, no, let him be. We need someone who will be praying for us. And so these were the parents and the father of Gregory, who we have as the saint. Eventually, Saint Gregory grew to be also wealthy and very well educated. The best education that there was at the time. The education of the ancient Greeks. He knew Aristotle and Plato off by heart. Something which for them was a massive, a huge thing. It showed the intelligence of St. Gregory. But apart from his human wisdom and his human intelligence, he had a great spiritual wisdom and intelligence, a deep intelligence. And although his teachers and his professors wanted him to exceed in government, in law, in some sort of high position, Gregory wasn't the sort. And he left for the holy mountain, which is known as Mount Athos, Aion Oros. Most of you have probably heard of it. He went to the monastery there of Vatopevi, and then later he was called to leave Mount Athos along with some monks and go to Thessaloniki to help the situation there. It was there at Thessaloniki that he became the teacher of one of the most important prayers that we have in our Orthodox Church. It is the shortest, the simplest, and most powerful prayer that we have in our church, which should and can be used by every single Orthodox Christian. And that prayer is the prayer we say of the heart. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The shortest and most effective prayer that we have in our church. And he became one of the teachers of that. And he taught the people how to implement two things. Prayer and asceticism. And to co combine the two together. Now, I mentioned this word before, asceticism. What is it? Basically, without asceticism, an Orthodox Christian cannot have a spiritual life. Without asceticism, our spiritual life is basically dead. And when I say Orthodox Christian, I mean whether you are a monk, a priest, a nun, a layperson, a doctor, a lawyer, a garbage collector, a teacher, anyone. Asceticism applies to each and every Christian. Asceticism is the renunciation of our own will and the implementing of God's will. And it takes a lot of the time, a lot of hard work, a lot of struggle, and yes, a lot of sacrifice. Because you leave aside all your own desires, all your own passions, whatever you know and whatever you're drawn to naturally, or what we think is natural, so that we can take in what God has to give to us. And that's a struggle. It's not easy a lot of the times to live by the will of God. It's not easy a lot of the times to constantly contemplate on God and have Him united with us. A lot of the times we have to give things up. A lot of the times we have to put things aside. Let me give you an example. All of you, in one way or another, practice asceticism, but in a different sense. In probably a more worldly or physical sense, rather than in the spiritual understanding of the word asceticism. Let me give you an example. How many of us are woken up in the morning by our alarm clock? And the alarm clock starts hitting, sorry. And the alarm clock starts hitting, and it's six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. What's our instant reaction? Oh, no. I've got another two hours of sleep in me, but I have to get up. I have to get up and go to work. You know you have to do it. Why? Because you have a responsibility, and that responsibility that you have to do will bring out a positive outcome. 
We practice asceticism a lot of the time when we're faced with two options. When we have in front of us that beautiful chocolate cake or we have a nice healthy piece of fruit. And you know that you're on a diet and you really want the chocolate cake, but you know that you have to practice asceticism in the worldly sense and take the piece of fruit. We practice asceticism a lot of the times when we're parents and we have to give up a lot of things like our sleep, like our sanity, like washing clothes that are disgusting and doing a lot of the chores and becoming practically slaves to our children. That is asceticism because you know from that comes a positive outcome. We practiced asceticism when we were going to school. None of us wanted to go to school. None of us wanted to do homework. None of us wanted to do assignments. But we did it because we wanted an outcome from it. We practice asceticism when we're sitting and we're relaxing on the couch watching our favorite TV show. And we know that the kitchen is a mess. We know that there are dishes everywhere. We know that they're so dirty that they're starting to grow mold on them and we have to go and clean it. So we turn off the TV, we get out of our own comfort zone and we go and we clean the kitchen. None of us want to do it, but we do it so that there is an outcome. And a lot of the times we feel good about ourselves. We feel good about ourselves. See, recently some of you will know that I was on holidays for a month and we have this thing with Presbyteram that because I'm God so many hours of the day, it's the, let's say, traditional way of living, that I'm the breadwinner and she looks after the home. So I work and because I'm gone very long hours, early in the morning and come very back, um, home late at night, I hardly do any housework at all. But Presbyteria does that because she can and she's at home. I was away for a month and I spent a good month at home, mostly, mostly at home. And the roles changed. I became the housewife and Brisvidera went and started for her first year teaching, going back after having three children. And so I was at home. And these are chores that I never do. And even when I look at them, I go, brisvidera has got it. But then finally, I knew it was my turn to do it. So I started. I started vacuuming, I started mopping, I started cleaning, I started washing the dishes. Everything was spotless. And it was so spotless that I started becoming obsessed when the kids were coming home and when my wife was coming home. I didn't want them to touch anything because I liked sitting back and just looking at everything clean. And in my own way, I knew that yes, I was practicing asceticism and I was enjoying the outcome of it. And so exactly the same thing works in our own spiritual life. Just like we have our day-to-day -day life and we have the physical chores that we have to do so that we can see and provide better outcomes, it's exactly the same thing with our relationship with God. Asceticism applied spiritually. And a lot of the times, it's not easy work. It's not easy work making a daily routine, prayer routine, to get up in the morning and spend 10 minutes praying to God. Before you go to bed, spending again time praying to God. Now we're in a time where we are fasting. And so giving up all those foods that we're used to eating, which in essence aren't a sin, but we're giving it up to practice self-control. Okay? And so to give that up, why? For the love of God. To know that self-control helps us control our own desires so that we can put the will of God first. It's not easy getting up on a Sunday morning when you've been working all week and know that it's your only Sunday that you have basically to sleep in. But I get up and I come to church so I can worship together with everyone else in unity, in love, and as one body, the body of Christ. And we do it. And the more we do it, although it's difficult a lot of the times, the more outcomes we see. The more we begin to do what St. Gregory taught us was 
was capable of every Christian doing? Experiencing God. And that is the fundamental thing, teaching of the Christian message. The experience and unity with God. If we haven't experienced God, then spiritually there is no life in us. We become dead. Just like when someone cannot progress in life because maybe they suffer from a mental illness. Maybe they suffer from, from depression. There are people, speak to people who have depression. And unfortunately today, it's such a common thing. And you speak to them, we speak to each other and they say, they say it doesn't matter how beautiful things are around them, everything is so dark. It's like that spiritually as well when we haven't experienced God. Everything is dry. Everything is dull. And nothing, we can't experience the beauty and the love of God. This is what the, the masters of our church taught us to do, which were people like St. Gregory Palamas, who taught us how to live God and be alive in Him and to experience Him in a real way. And now, now the church is calling us to do exactly that. This time of Lent is a time of asceticism. It's a time of prayer and it's a time of applying ourselves and say, okay, I've fallen away. Again, I've become lazy spiritually. Again, I've let myself drift away from God. Okay, the church is calling me again and giving me that opportunity to be united with him because we're, we're humans and we have our weaknesses. And we do that now. And so we do that in remembrance not only of his death, but to die with him so that we can be resurrected with him. And on that note, brothers and sisters, a lot of the times I don't speak about how we can fully live this. And St. Gregory t teaches us how we live it mysteriously through our private asceticism, but through the medication that the church gives us. And a lot of you partake of it, but we don't even know why or how we should partake of it. And that is of Holy Communion. When we come and we take the body and blood of Christ, no greater gift is given to us than taking the body and blood of Christ. Something which should be done not once a year, but as regularly and as often as we can. As regularly as we can. If you come to church often, then there shouldn't be any reason why you should not be communing at least once a week. Obviously with the blessing of your own spiritual fathers. Because you're here. The gift has been given to you. We say that Christ says, come and receive me. And then we don't receive the, this gift. In a way, that's a blasphemy. It's a rejection of Christ himself. And then we ask ourselves, why am I not receiving the gift which is being offered to me? by Christ? Is it because we maybe feel a little bit unworthy? Is it because maybe we've done something which we feel like we, um, uh, we feel like we're sorry for and we, we, we repent for but we don't feel worthy to approach? And Christ tells us that none of us are worthy. None of us. And that's why we have the second most important sacrament which is the sacrament of confession where we go to the priest and we confess to him our sins and he reads the prayer of forgiveness over us. And we don't confess to the priest because he's the one that's going to take our sins away. No. We, repress, we confess to the priest in utter humility. And as we go and tell our doctor our physical problems, we run to our spiritual doctors and we tell them our spiritual problems, our spiritual infirmities. And that's why confession is a fundamental sacrament of the church. And now is a great opportunity during Lent, because I know many of you will come and receive Holy Communion on Holy and Great Saturday, on where, whenever it is that you're going to come and receive Communion. At least when you come, come prepared, so that you can experience that which Christ has to offer you and that you're just not taking something for the sake of taking it 
as a tradition. There can't be any worse, worse blasphemy than that. Taking Holy Communion because it's tradition and not because we believe that it's the unity with Christ himself. As you leave today, I want you to collect two pamphlets. One in yellow and one in white. The first pamphlet is called On the Healing Sacrament of Confession. And you can read about why it's so important and who you can go to so that you can confess. There's a list of English-speaking priests and Greek-speaking priests and which churches they're at. And the yellow pamphlet is one about Holy Communion and how to properly prepare yourself before you receive the sacrament of communion so that it can be for us something which is not only life-changing, not life-changing, but life-giving because Christ for us is the source of life. Amen.